just as people who were knowledgeable about it knew that Katrina was going to happen and knew what the result would be, but they were unable or unwilling to respond to it anyway. And one of the great results is that hundreds of thousands of people are impoverished and not likely to recover anytime soon. So what is the answer? How do we bring about or start to bring about economic equity? How do we end the poverty? Well, there, there, there are many, many different ways. You know, people are always saying, what's the one thing we need to do? And of course, there isn't one thing we need to do. There are so many things we need to do. But among the things we need to do is to um, have an education system that prepares our children to be competitive in the modern world. We need to have a uh, system of, of public works that becomes an employer for people who cannot compete effectively in, in the market system. Uh, we need to uh, eliminate these Bush tax cuts as quickly as we possibly can and never institute them again and make the people who have, to their credit, uh, become successful in this company, pay for the success that they've had and for the opportunities they've had to be successful. So those are just three of the things we need to do, and there, there are many, many more. So you know that, I think it's back, know that you've made it really big. Not when you're a presidential candidate or a vice presidential nominee. You've made it really big when you've been interviewed by me. That's one. And, um, I, I feel it. You can feel it. <laughs> and you've made it really big when you are the host of Saturday Night Live. Um, on April 19th, 1977, you were a host on Saturday Night Live. That, that was when it was a comedy show. Right. <laughs> so you, you did a segment on that show, and um, it still was and still is one of the funniest and most popular of all time. And uh, let's take a look. Good evening and welcome to Black Perspective. I'm your host, Garrett Morris, and tonight our guest is Mr. Julian Bond. And we'll be talking about the myths surrounding Black IQ, specifically the myth that whites are inherently more intelligent than blacks. Good evening, Garrett. Good evening, Julian. Now, Julian, perhaps you could explain something to me, man. In all of these studies, comparing black IQ to white IQ, what kind of test is used to measure IQ in the first place? Well, that's the major problem with these studies, Garrett. The measurement of IQs which are used in these tests uh -huh. come from tests pr prepared by whites uh -huh. for whites. Therefore, the tests are culturally biased, so it's not surprising then that whites would score better than blacks do. Mm -hmm. Could you give us an example of what you're talking about? Oh, surely. Yeah. Here are some questions that were asked recently on the 1977 Stanford Petri IQ test. Mm -hmm. Number one, you have been invited over for cocktails by the officer of your trust fund. <laughs> cocktails, cocktails begin at 4.30 but you must make an appearance at a six o'clock formal <coughs> dinner at the Yacht Club. <laughs> what do you do about dress? A, wear your blue striped seersucker suit to cocktails <laughs> and change into your tuxedo in the bathroom, apologizing to your host for the inconvenience, or B, wear your tuxedo to cocktails, apologizing to your host for wearing a dinner jacket before 6 p.m., <laughs> or C, Walk to the subway at Columbus Circle and take the A train uptown. <laughs> well, I guess I would take the A train. No, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Damn. Damn. Let, me, uh, let me tell you about another. Yeah. When, when waxing your skis for cross country. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> hey, Judith, I know what the problem is with the test. See? But look, man. They've been saying that whites are smarter than blacks for hundreds of years, baby, right? And we've only had these IQ tests for, what, 20, 30 years. Now, how did the IQ of white intellectual, uh, intellectual uh, superiority originate in the first place? Well, that's a very interesting point. My theory is that it's based on the fact that light-skinned blacks are smarter than dark-skinned blacks. <laughs> I said it may have grown out of the observation that light-skinned blacks are smarter than dark-skinned blacks. I, I, I don't get it. You're well, it has nothing to do with white blood. It's just that the descendants of lighter-skinned African tribes uh -huh. are much more intelligent than the descendants of darker-skinned African tribes. 
Everybody knows that. <laughs> but this is the first I've heard of it. Man. Really? Yeah. Oh, it was proven a long time ago. Well, I, I still don't quite understand it. You know, but we were running out of time. But perhaps you could come and talk about this, you know, um, and explain it further on another show. Well, there's really very little to explain. It's just like I've told you. Well, we're running out of time. Uh, good, good night. Uh, maybe you could explain it to me again, man. You said the blacks are inherently smaller than white. <laughs> And? And I say that, as you see, it used to be a comedy show. <laughs> You're amazing. Uh, so on matters of race, how are we doing in America? Well, I think we're actually doing better. Take a 50-year span. I think we're doing much better now than we were 50 years ago. Not radically better. Things have not changed enormously. Um, well, in, in that 50-year span, some things have changed fairly radically. We've passed a series of laws that protect the right to go here and go there, to pass, to vote, and so on. Uh, so there have been some pretty firm jumps forward. But, of course, every time you jump forward, you notice that you haven't quite jumped enough, and you've got to, to jump or push some more. So we're doing well. Uh, we need to do a whole lot better. In 11 months and 20 days, there will be a new face in the White House. Um, before we get to the subject of the presidential races, I want to take a moment, talk about political campaigning. You were involved in a nasty political race in the 70s. It was a congressional race between you and John Lewis, an African American, um, and this was on a, a seat in the US House of Representatives. This was your first congressional race. Um, John Lewis raised uh, allegations about your having drug use, talked about cocaine use, allegations you denied. Things got so bad, there was uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office began to investigate you, grand jury was convened, and even your then, I guess she was your estranged wife, made allegations um, about your drug use. Um, what was all that about and what happened? Well, it was about wanting to win badly. And, uh, you know, John and I had been very, very close friends. And uh, I think he wanted to win more badly than I did. So how did you handle all that? What? For a long time, we stopped being friends. And he won, obviously. Yes, He's he in won, the, and he next. served with uh, great distinction. He's there right now. Um, and that was the last time, I guess, you held public office, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. Uh, do you think that if Barack Obama is the Democratic nominee, that he will face that same kind of thing, given that he's acknowledged using some drugs when he was young? Oh, sure, because if he becomes the Democratic nominee, he's running against a political party that has proven that they will go to the lowest, lowest level in, in opposing. Um, whomever it is they want to oppose. And you've already seen some hints of this. Uh, you know, Obama's middle name is Hussein. And uh, there are TV commentators and talk show hosts who now don't call him Barack Obama, but it's Barack Hussein o Obama. Just wanted to remind them, the public of, of this. Um, we've already seen, uh, you know, widespread distribution of emails uh, that uh, maintain he's a Muslim, that he went to a madrasa, uh, neither of which is true. He's a Methodist, I think, uh, and went to you know regular schools. Uh, so yeah, it's going to get hot and heavy. So if you could give him advice, what would you say to him? I'd say answer back as quick as you can. And in, in this, in fact, he ought to take a lesson from Bill Clinton. Answer back as quick as you can. Uh, don't do like John Kerry and wait and wait and wait and wait and then three weeks later say, oh, by the way, that was not true. You know, you got to, bam, you got to hit these people just like that and uh, keep on pushing. Whom do you believe the Republican candidate will be? I really don't know. Um, as, as you know, the NAACP is nonpartisan. We don't <coughs> ever endorse candidates for public office or political parties. Uh, we're down now to uh, Governor Romney, and I guess his attraction is that wherever your belief system is, he's there. Um, and uh, 
John McCain, whose attraction is that under a genial uh, personality uh, rests a heart that is as conservative as anyone. Uh, it's something he's managed to, and, and he's also the favorite of, of journalists. They, they are quite fond of him. If you just watch the coverage, it's, it's almost fawning. Uh, so he, he has an advantage, and if I were picking, I would pick him. Hmm. Um, whom do you see getting the Democratic nomination? I really don't know. We'll, I think, know a little more in, uh, after uh, the next week has passed and seen what the result of these uh, Super Tuesday uh, primaries will be. But they may not even settle it. It might even come down to a uh, convention fight, although I very much mm -hmm. doubt that. But I really don't know. Now, the NAACP cannot endorse. Uh, are you in a position to state just your own individual feeling about who you support? No. Okay. Straightforward, right out. <laughs> so we're going to turn now to some question and answer. Uh, and after question and answer, we're going to wrap up this conversation. So do we have any of you who have any, the microphones are right there. You can just go stand on a microphone and ask your question. I actually have <clears throat> endless questions. So. This was just a just teaser. Just one. This, I know, I just teaser, but I am aware of just a statement that the only biography on you ended in the Stone Age, and I'm hoping that you will update that someday. And I'm here to volunteer if you need to help writing. Um, but my question to you is Vietnam War. One question that Judge Cordell didn't ask you was if you were drafted during that period, and if you were, what you did about it. No, you know, I was, uh, like all other young men, I had to take a, a physical uh, at the uh, Army Center in Atlanta. About 150 young men all went in there and uh, stripped to our underwear, and, you know, turned their head to the right and coughed. And, uh, and some of the men here know what I'm talking about. Uh, and went through the whole rigmarole, and then they, um, lined us all up and asked us if any of us had ever been arrested. And out of 150, I guess 25 said yes. And then you had to come by the sergeant and call last name first, Bond Julian, and say what it was. Most of this was for drunken driving, a couple for non-support. And uh, when I came up and called my name, he said, I know all about you, fella. He said, I've got a letter here from the adjutant general at Fort McPherson. It says you were arrested in one of those sit-down demonstrations. He said, this is a serious business. You may never get in this man's army. I tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get a moral waiver from the adjutant general. So you're going home. So I go home and uh, time passed. I was still living with my family. I got a letter from the draft board and as mothers will do, my mother opened it up and it said, you have been classified for Y. Well, every man knew what for F meant. Mm -hmm. 4F meant that there's something wrong with you physically, your eyesight was bad, your, some injury or something, you couldn't go. And every man knew what 1A was. 1A meant, you know, pack your bag, you're going to Mars. But I'd never heard of 4Y. So my mother called up the draft board and she said in ominous tones, she said, we can't tell you over the telephone. So I went down there and I asked the uh, clerk, the woman, what it meant. She said, this means not to be called except in case of national emergency. So, uh, you know, they never called me. A national emergency never came. I, I was never called. Wow, good question. And, you know, therefore didn't have to answer the question of what would I have done mm -hmm. if I had been called. What would you have done? I don't, I don't know. Interesting. In regard to the election, despite the fact that we will not learn tonight who you personally support, do you agree with Carolyn and Ted Kennedy that we are at a defining moment in our country's future. 